welcome to uh, phylogeny in the tree of life. Um, and so the, the purpose of this, uh, this lesson um, is that we're going to be looking at how um, evolution has truly gone, at least our current idea of how it's gone through over the, you know, the past X amount of years of life. Um, and uh, effectively, you might be wondering what the heck a tree of life is. That'll come up in a second. But the, the idea of this entire lesson is to learn how to do a phylogeny. Um, you've probably seen these uh, throughout the past couple lessons and in maybe in prior um, like classes and things like that as well. Um, the chapters for this are chapter 4.1, pages 220 and 222, or 222, and 430 and 432, the last being the, the most helpful for your f unit project for this. Um, this will culminate evolution as a whole. Um, evolution is really only three lessons, um, and you might be wondering, wow, it was kind of short. Um, you know, content-wise, um, but that's only because the amount of knowledge that you already had prior, um, and so we're kind of compiling everything together. Um, hypothetically, we could do this, uh, we could have done this lesson after ecology and then gotten even a better understanding of, well, why, you know, there's so many branches between life. Um, this here is considered a phylogeny, um, with the bottom here being what we assume as prebiotic evolution, there is hypothesized multiple different molecules that may have or could have become what we are today. Um, and then we see the origin of life and then we see it branching off from there. Um, the, all of the, the reason why it disappears is all of these offshoots are all of the you know, living organisms that have you know, passed away and you know, become extinct. And so all of these fossil records that we have you know, uh, are essentially a long line of trial and error getting up to where we are today so we only have you know a, a hand f um you know a handful of uh, of living organisms comparatively to what we've had over the past um, and so all of the groups that are survivals today have um, you can trace their origins to the origin of life um, we don't know what the origin of life was if that makes sense we have ideas but until we have a time machine we really can't go back there um, and so this GIF here is kind of cool on that point. Um, and now, so this is the first time that we will be uh, doing things on, um, you know, recorded wise. And so um, in class, uh, I'll also be going over this um, and uh, I'll be going over the lessons really quickly because some of the assignments are in, you know, the, uh, this, this lesson itself. Uh, but, you know, I want you guys to go into um, Schoology uh, and go to check-ins and you'll notice what is the tree of life. <clears throat> um, so complete this check-in, uh, you know, what do you think the tree of life is? I've given some examples here. We see, you know, some DNA with our organisms around it. We see these fossils, um, you know, we see the pedigree that we did in genetics. Um, and then we, you know, if you're looking in mythological wise, you know, the tree of life, also known as Isidril, um, you know, from uh, Norse mythology uh, is where the entire universe, or at least, you know, these specific planets, um, you know, are aligning. Um, for those of you who are big fans of the Thor movies, uh, this is, you know, they talk about this tree a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, games like God of War and others as well have used this, you know, to their, um, you know, to explore this idea further of what the tree of life is. Um, and then, you know, a quick challenge, you know, some of you guys might, it might not be that much of one, but how do you think we find evidence of this tree of life? Um, we're going to be going over this specifically in the next couple, you know, seconds. Um, but I'll, I'll give about, a, let's say, 20 seconds for this video, um, or maybe 10, uh, you know, for you guys to pause it, go complete the check-in, and then we'll come back and kind of discuss it further. Um, we'll discuss this in class as well. So for those of you who are watching it only on uh, via the this video, then um, we did go over it in class. So. Um, and so the tree of life, at least as we see it today, is uh, very basically drawn in this three bubble picture here. Um, you may have seen this picture uh, when we first joined the class um, back in September or August. Uh, but the idea of uh, the tree of life is that one common ancestor of all life, this line prior to that, is most likely um, the prebiotic organism that existed prior to the first cell. But the first cell diverges two times, um, for the major diverging at least. We see a grouping of bacteria, and then we see a, a divergence towards Eukarya and Archaea, with a, then again a split separating those two. Um, and so these are the three domains of life which we talked about in the past. Um, archaea and bacteria being single-celled organisms, 
while eukarya are multi-celled organisms. Um, animals are this tiny little red line, and somewhere in that animal red line will be humans. Um, you know, plants and anim uh, plants and fungi are also selected red. Um, if you, when you guys go off to university, um, or if you, you know, and you take a biology class, you might see this picture as well, um, or at least a modified version of it, and they'll kind of go into each of these different large groupings we have here. Um, these are all major organisms on the planet that, um, in types of organisms, uh, and it's important to learn all of them, but in this class, we really won't be looking at all of them. Um, and so, you know, humans are in this animal section, and we'll talk about, you know, how we expect this tree to, you know, expand upon over time. Um, and the main form of evidence that we have besides DNA, as we talked about before, was the geological record. Um, when we talked about those scientists going over the idea of evolution, the geological record was brought up. Um, and the general idea for this geological record is that as you go down into the earth, um, sedimentation that has gone on top of it will give us different eras of the, the, of the planet itself. Um, the deepest stuff we can find is Precambrian. Um, so we can really only go back fossil-wise on an average area around the planet to the Cambrian era. Uh, but as you can see here, um, we actually go back even farther than Cambrian, which we'll talk about as well. Um, specifically, the Cambrian era was um, when the greatest explosion of life appeared. And so this is why for this picture of um, the Grand Canyon, um, if you dig down, you'll see that there's different types of stone, each that hold different types of organisms throughout the history of life. Um, and, uh, you know, we can keep going down even further than that, um, but we don't really see much once we start going down that far, mainly due to the fact that it's mainly um, uh, single-celled life forms, and so it's very hard to find fossils of single-celled life forms because you needed a lot of them to leave a fossil. Um, so figuring out what was prior to that, um, uh, you know, we, we don't have much evidence for. Well, I mean, we have evidence, but we don't have, you know, the exorbitant amount of evidence we do from the Cambrian onwards. Um, specifically, which we'll look at, we'll look at this picture blown up, um, but the general idea, again, is as you dig down into the earth, the farther down from the top of the soil, um, we see different types of um, stone being laid down, and thus we can, you know, see different kinds of um, organisms as we move down as well. Um, all the organisms that are there are extinct at this point, um, but they're... Uh, relatives, as you could say, survived, um, because we can see similarities between organisms from uh, back then towards comparing them to today. So starting from the very beginning, the bottom of this picture, then we'll move upwards. Um, so if we go back approximately 4 billion, 600 um, million years ago, uh, we see the origin of Earth, essentially uh, as a large amount of space dust collided with each other. We gain a planet called Earth revolving around um, the, the sun. Um, and during this time period, we, we do see um, the moon forming and things like that, but it really isn't for about a billion um, years that we see uh, the oldest known rocks on Earth appearing. Um, we'll talk about exactly how we know how old the rocks are. That'll be the next part of the geological record. Um, but the general consensus is uh, 3.8 billion years ago is the oldest rocks. Um, due to how we know how long it takes for these rocks to form, um, we extrapolated the origin of Earth, um, but we don't really have any uh, physical evidence besides math to show that it, this is the origin of Earth. So it might even be older, we just don't necessarily know. Um, now 3.5 million years ago is the oldest fossil that we've ever found. Um, again, using a technique called, um, well not necessarily carbon dating, uh, but using elemental dating in order to figure out how old the, the, the fossils are, we figured out these cells, which were prokaryotes. Um, these are single-celled organisms. Um, we found these uh, to be around 3.5 billion years ago. So literally a billion years after the um, Earth is formed, we see life. We're going to fast forward 700 million years to see concentration of oxygen beginning to increase, uh, which must mean that there is something um, at this point uh, creating oxygen because oxygen for the most part isn't just readily made as a gas um, it can be made and it is made in some chemical reactions um, but we'll see a, uh, a much larger amount of um, oxygen being formed due to the living things creating it um, and so this is uh, essentially called the Archaean era um, the next era we're going to be looking at is the Protozoic era um, and so during this era we see that the oldest fossils of eukaryotes forming um, specifically, what these were were 
um, basic animal cells, as you could call them, uh, that were eating, uh, from what we can tell, plant-like cells. Um, these plant-like cells uh, are not necessarily plants like what we see them today, more probably closely related to what lives in the ocean. Um, and so we call these uh, blue cyanobacteria, um, and these bacteria can produce oxygen. So what we see that 2.7 million, or sorry, billion point of years. Um, if you're wondering why I'm saying larger numbers in the thousands here, um, these are millions of years. So a thousand million years is considered a billion. Um, and so that's why I'm giving those. But we see the first eukaryotic cells appear, um, specifically this circle, kind of spiral-ish shape um, bacteria. Um, these are multiple cells in a row, essentially. So it's a colony of organisms. Uh, but this is the first eukaryotic cell that we can find in the fossil record. We're going to fast forward even more about 2 billion years um, towards 635 million years ago um, in the Indiacaran uh, um, era and or period specifically. Um, and so we see diverse algae. Algae are precursors to plants. Um, and you can still see them today. Uh, algae is all, um, seaweed is a form of algae as an example. Um, we also see start seeing soft-bodied invertebrate animals appear. So the first animals that aren't amoebas um, start appearing. So this is when we start seeing things like jellyfish and um, uh, maybe corals and things like that kind of starting out to exist for the first time. So very basic animals, things that just kind of float around. There's no eyeballs. There's no you know real hunting methods in this case. Um, and instead, they're kind of just floating around waiting for food, if that makes sense. Um, most of these were predators. Um, and it isn't for a while that we see um, uh, the algae, you know, becoming part of the animals as we see in coral. Um, so these are uh, predatory um, animals specifically um, towards plants, um, well, plant cells. Uh, the Cambrian era, 542 billion or million years ago to 488 million years ago is called the Great Explosion. Um, similar to, or the Cambrian explosion, similar to what you guys learned in the past about the great dying. Um, the Cambrian explosion is what we see a humongous diversity of organisms um, in the fossil record. Um, specifically, you can see these if you go out into the desert um, or even up Walnut Hill, um, there, and there's like fossil trail and stuff like that up by uh, Simi Valley. Um, you can find Cambrian fossils in the rocks. Um, specifically, these guys on the right here, them circling, called trilobites. Um, they are also these up here. Um, you will find these in the fossils all over the planet. Um, so this was one of the most common organisms on the planet at one point, at least for, you know, about 200 million years or 100 million years. Um, and so huge diversity in life, specifically animals is what we see. Um, and we start getting more and more invertebrates. Um, invertebrates are things without a backbone. So uh, human ancestry wouldn't really appear for a long, long time after this. Uh, the Ordovician period um, is uh, known for its aquatic life, specifically marine algae. Um, so we start seeing the uh, radiation, in other words, the separation of um, uh, aquatic plants, as you could call them, um, and uh, specifically things like seaweed and other uh, algae um, that exist in the ocean. Um, the colonization of land um, by fungi, plants, and animals is also seen during this 40 million years. Um, and uh, it's um, quite interesting. And if you take a evolutionary botany class, you'll learn how difficult it was for plants to go on land and then for animals to as well do it. Um, you know, it's, it's a huge change in environment. The sun and the environment above the water is extremely harsh, while in water, it's actually quite nice. Um, so uh, next we'll be looking at the, this is still part of the Paleozoic era. Um, we call this the Silurian period. Um, this is when we start seeing early vascular plants, things like ferns, um, start appearing for the first time, um, and some other, uh, like mosses and things like that. Well, not mosses, but mosses existed in the Ordovician period. Um, the Silurian period, we start seeing things like ferns. Um, so very basic flowers and tree-like plants existing. Uh, the Devonian period is also known as the era of fishes. Um, and so we see a huge diversification of fish species, specifically bony fishes. Yes, there's non-bony fishes that exist as well. Um, and also the first tetrapod appeared in the fossil record. Um, this little green alligator looking guy in the blurry image. Um, this would be considered the, um, the farthest ancestor we can find for say a human um, when it comes to something that would kind of look similar to us. Um, so we start seeing uh, vertebrates appearing and becoming more noticeable in the fossil record during this time. So things with a backbone um, but also we start seeing things with four limbs appearing. 
Um, insects also appear at the same time period, so that does mean that shark ancestry is somewhat older or roughly the same age as insect ancestry. Um, insects, again, are primarily only on the land, um, and so we start seeing gigantic, uh, thing, um, gigantic dragonflies and stuff like that. Um, when I mean gigantic, I mean the size of your dog dragonflies. Um, so the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere during the Devonian period was extremely large. Um, and so larger insects were able to, you know, um, thrive during this time period. Um, the Carboniferous period is the first time we start seeing forests. Um, so extensive forests appearing uh, from gymnosperms, which are uh, pine trees. And um, later on, we'll start seeing, um, well, gymnosperms come later, but like essentially gigantic forests made of ferns is the best way to describe it. Um, these were slightly hardwooded, not necessarily as hardwooded as, say, our normal trees now, but um, kind of closer to bamboo, I guess you could think. Um, the first seeds appear, so it's a really weird idea to think of plants without seeds. Um, for those of you who have ferns in your backyard or around your neighborhood, um, go look at the underneath of it, and you'll see little pods. Um, these pods are how they um, spread their pollen, um, and male ferns will have sperm-like um, excretions that they make in order to... Um, you know, fertilize other fern plants. Uh, reptiles also appeared in the Carboniferous period, and amphibians are extremely dominant during this time period. Um, so we see things like frogs and stuff like that appearing. Um, the Permian era is probably the beginning of uh, reptiles' dominance. Um, so huge radiation, again, spreading of different types of organisms. Um, uh, the origin of most present-day groups of insects, so we're starting to seeing ants and bees and things like beetles and stuff like that existing. Um, prior, we were just seeing uh, fly-like organisms existing, but now we're seeing large amounts of insect species. Um, spiders also start appearing during this time period. They're not insects, though. Uh, the Permian era, as we know, is the great dying. Um, and so many marine and terrestrial organisms died at the end of the period um, to what we think was a volcanic explosion, um, causing uh, essentially the entire environments of the planet to change over you know, only a very short period of time. So we, in the fossil record, we see large amounts of death um, around the 251 million years period. Uh, the Mesozoic period is also known as the dinosaur time. Um, and so from 251 to 600 or 65.5 million years, we see dinosaurs. Um, dinosaurs still exist today, and I'll talk about that further in this, uh, this lesson. Um, but the Triassic period, we see cone-bearing plants. So these are modern day pine trees. Um, dominating the landscape, so gigantic forests made of pine trees everywhere, um, dinosaurs walking around, um, and the origin of mammals um, from a reptilian ancestor um, appear. Um, and so we start seeing small mammal-like creatures, probably what we would consider as more of a hairy dinosaur or like a kind of rat-like creature um, existing during this time period. Um, the Jurassic, nothing really big happened during this time period, just more dinosaurs, more pine trees. Um, the Cretaceous period is extremely important because we see angiosperms. Uh, these are uh, flowering plants to be specific, so um, fruits and vegetables start appearing during this time period. Uh, dinosaurs also become more prevalent during this time period of the Cretaceous era, um, but um, they become extinct at the end of the period, as you guys know, from what we expect to be a meteorite hitting uh, present day the Yucatan Peninsula. And then lastly, the uh, Cenozoic period um, uh, is known as the uh, essentially the mammalian era. Um, and so we're going to start with the Paleogene. After all of the um, major life form on the planet, being dinosaurs, uh, disappear, ecological niches, which are like um, perfect areas for organisms to thrive in, um, mammals radiated uh, extremely. So we start seeing mammals taking the places of large um, lizards, and so we start seeing things like bears and birds, not birds, but uh, bears and um, uh, like elephant like species and things like that um, appearing in this time period. Um, and so, uh, also during this time period, we also start seeing the smaller, um, more agile lizards uh, becoming more bird like as well. Um, so, around uh, the Cretaceous period, we start seeing, you know, uh, the ancestry of birds as well. They also come from reptiles. Um, the Eocene, we see uh, huge amounts of flowers existing. So we start seeing the huge amount of flower diversity comes from this, um, this uh, epic, as we call it. 
Um, and so uh, we also see a lot of present-day mammalian orders starting. Primates start in the Oligocene. Then we start seeing um, what we would consider modern-day bears um, and other organi organisms like the mammoth, things like that, appearing during this time period. Um, the earliest human ancestry can be traced back to some thing similar to a chimpanzee or bonobo um, around 23 million years ago, or roughly about 10, I would say, during the Miocene. Um, uh, the Pliocene, we see bipedal human ancestry, so this would be as close as you can get to a chimpanzee or gorilla, to an extent, um, uh, as an example. Uh, and then uh, roughly um, 2.6 uh, million years ago, we get the Ice Age. So the mammoth appears um, in, in larger areas around the world, um, and they really don't disappear until uh, after the pyramids are built, is when the last mammoth is hypothesized to pass away. Uh, but the origin of the genus Homo is uh, roughly going to be 100,000 years ago. Um, and uh, less than 10,000 years ago, um, we see historical times starting. So humanity doesn't really start for, you know, we're, we're a small blip in this gigantic history um, of life. Um, and we'll see how long, you know, we last. And so the question becomes is, how the heck do we know all this? How do we know how old things are? You know, we weren't, we can't go back in time and see them. Um, it ends up being, uh, we can age rocks, you know, kind of weird to think about how old a rock is. Um, but I'm sure you've heard, you know, this mountain or this, you know, fossil is this old. And so the way they figured that out is via um, dating rocks. And no, I don't mean literally like holding hands and going for a nice dinner. Uh, but I mean like literally looking at the chemical and molecules, oh. whoops, excuse me, that are, are in the, um, the rock sample. And since fossils are, yes, rocks, um, they have the, the, the rock materials have replaced the biological materials at this point, leaving an imprint. Um, and so we can use those to figure out how old these organisms used to be um, and how old the rocks in general are. Um, some popular ones to use are carbon, um, uranium, and radon, um, and radium as well, as an example for how to age rocks. Um, the idea for these is over time, um, these molecules, not specific molecules, these atoms will decay into smaller atoms further up the periodic table. So the heavier the atom, the higher chance it has of breaking apart um, into a more stable, uh, into a more stable atom. Um, helium being the, one of the most stable atoms on the planet, things want to end up as helium at the end. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of noble gases, but we'll talk more about those in chemistry as well. Um, uranium is another good example. Um, so the heavier the um, or the, the heavier the atom, um, the older it, or the longer it generally takes for it to break apart. Um, carbon specifically, we can see uh, up to around, uh, I think, 48,000 years on pretty decent accuracy. Um, so we use this for looking at uh, really the last 100,000 years. Um, so human era, whoops, um, we use carbon for. Uh, but for really old rocks and things like that, we use polonium, uh, uranium, and radium. Um, as examples for rocks that take a long time to turn into other elements. Uranium turns to lead, um, but we'll have examples of the math in this uh, as well. And so um, the fossil record um, uh, can be again seen um, via a few different ways. Um, it isn't just uh, looking at half or looking at the radiometric dating as we call it. Um, we can also use magnetic reversal and I'll put some videos in the video folder for this. Uh, but the idea is that uh, iron particles that are in the rocks will align themselves with the magnetic field um, of the earth when they cool. So iron that was heated up at one point um, and the particles that are formed during this process will essentially point towards north um, is the best way to describe it. Um, but north and south poles for the last, you know, every around every hundred thousand years or so um, will flip upside down. So north will become south and south will become north. This is a natural occurring phenomena that we see in the seafloor. And we can see that the iron particles point to different directions depending on um, the time period they were formed. So looking at where um, volcanic areas are, we'll see these iron particles flipping around. Um, but this is really only good if you're looking at volcanoes and mountains and things like that um, and, and the seafloor. Um, for living organisms, it's a little bit more different um, because uh, they could have somehow eaten you know, an, you know, the wrong generation of iron as an example. The more accurate one is radiometric dating, also known as half-life. Um, and so we measure the half-life, which is the time it takes for a molecule or, or a 
um, atom to essentially decrease by half and decay into its, uh, you know, its other form as an example. Um, and so certain molecules and atoms have different times. Um, and so the half-life, as we call it, is the number of years to take for 50% of the isotope, which is a type of atom, um, to decay into whatever it's turning into. Um, each isotope or, or different forms of an element have different lifespans. So you might hear carbon-14, carbon-13 being used. You might hear uranium-236, silver-237 being used, and so on and so forth. And we, we know we have a lot of math pointing towards how long it takes for these to break apart. Um, some atoms take, have a half-life of less than a second. Others have half-lives of a billion years. Um, and we can see this by measuring how much uh, disappears every day and you know extrapolating from there. Um, the equation is super duper easy. Um, for those of you who've never seen exponents before, it's that little number that's smaller in the top right corner of the of the number prior. But the percent of the element that will be left equals one half the um, the number of half lives that have gone through. So if we um, for n in this case the number of half lives here we have a hundred percent. You could say after. 50% of the isotope has decayed, we're now at half-life 2. After 50% of that, we're now at 25%, because 50 times 50 is 25 for percentages. Um, then to 12.5, then to 6.25 as well. Um, and so on and so forth, going down and down and down, trying to figure out how much of the sample we have left. Um, and so we um, there will be some... Uh, practice problems on the next slide, and then you guys will have a small assignment going over them as well. Um, super easy to, to use these, um, kind of just using a chart, things like that. And so as an example here, um, we'll be looking at the half-life of carbon, the most common one to use human um, or to measure recent events in. So things like uh, ancient civilizations and uh, really up to the Ice Age um, starting, or the starting Ice Age, we use carbon to, to figure this out. Um, when a living organism dies, it dies with a very specific percentage of carbon-14. Um, that is a finite percent. It will not make any more. Um, carbon-14 is made through the metabolic processes of the body, and it's stored in your body. So when you die, you die with 100% of your carbon-14. Um, and so because of that, we can see how much of it is left in, um, uh, how much is left in the body of a fossil or say a skeleton that we find you know, in a tomb or something like that, or in a swamp, wherever we're looking for in the world. But uh, essentially, it has a half-life of 5,730 years. How many years old is a fossil with five half-lives? And then what is the percentage of carbon-14 is left? Um, and then the challenge for this, which we'll go over, is carbon-14 can be measured to 0.12% of all carbon fossils. Um, uh, what is the oldest fossil that we can date using this method of carbon? And so I'm going to exit out of here, stop presenting, and I'm just going to copy and paste this into our um, thing here. And uh, let's make let's hit enter a bunch of times so we have room to, to write. Oh, that should be good enough. All right, and so if you're curious on how to do this, um, I want that gone. All right, so carbon-14 has a half-life of uh, 5,730 years. So in this case, N equals 5,130 years, or specifically um, N, as we said, the number of half-lives is also equal to every, oh, I just wrote every really badly. Fix that for you. Every 5,730 years. So every, every that amount of time, we see that there is that many years left. And so we just want to know if we have five half-lives. So we have five N. This is going to equal five times that we see the 5,730 years. And you essentially just multiply this together. Um, where is my calculator? There it is. And so if you plug in five times 5,730, um, you should be able to get your answer. 
Um, I'll hold off for, let's say, whoops, I didn't mean to move this. Uh, let's say 10 seconds. So when that hits the top, I'll give you guys the answer. But pause now if you want to work on this yourself. Um, and here we have 28,650 years as our total amount. So roughly 30,000 years ago, the fossil they found that had five half-lives um, uh, of carbon left um, is this amount of years old. Um, obviously, there's huge, uh, you know, amounts of time between each one, so the percentages aren't that accurate. So that's why they usually say when they're when we're dating something, it is around this many years old. Um, when we go into the millions, it could be you know plus or minus a million, and that's a humongous amount of time, right? So please do keep that in mind. Um, there are more accurate methods, um, but uh, you'll if you are super curious and you really like this kind of science. Um, you'll learn how to do that in geology, um, in most likely in, at the university. And so the next one is carbon-14 can be measured to 0.12% of all carbon in fossils. Uh, what is the oldest fossil that we can date with this isotope? And you can do this mathematically, or you can do it, you know, by just writing down each of them. And so we have, you know, if we say 50% equals N, we say that... Um, 25% is one more half-life because we halved the half. And then we go down there from there, 12.5% is 3n. And then we have um, uh, 6.25% is 4n. And we keep going on and on until we get down to this number. You should be able to figure out what um, how many half-lives there is. Um, and then with the number of half-lives, you essentially do the, um, you know, we said it was 5,730 times, you know, n. If this is, you know, 5n, 6n, you put you replace the number with that, you know, equals your answer. But um, while you're doing this, uh, if you want me to show the answer, I will continue going on. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you want to fast forward here to the end of this, um, you have that ability as well. So 6.25, oops. So now we are at 5n being 0.03125. Um, whoops, that is a, that should be percentage wise, 3 points. So we need to keep going from here. So 6n in this case is going to equal 1.5625. And you can see that the percentages are starting not to uh, um, decrease as much. And so 7n is 0 0.78125%. You know, um, I'm starting to run out of room, so I'm not going to write out as many numbers for the next one. Uh, so next we have 0.39%. Um, we're getting there. We're close. We're not, uh, you know, too far away now. Now we're at, you know, 9N being uh, 0 0.19, uh, 0.19.5%, and so on and so forth. And so I'm just going to draw an arrow here going to, um, I'm just going to keep hitting divided by 2 each single time to, you know, keep having it over and over again. I believe I did it four more times, I think. One, two, three, four. Yeah, four. So I did four times. So all the way to 13n being uh, 0 0.012%. Oh, let me draw this over a bit. Um, and so um, this is essentially how we can get to the number of half-lives and so in this case we're going to be why is this not erasing on anything there we go um, so we're going to have 13n in this case so we're just going to multiply that number by 5730 times 13 
will give us the total number of 74,490 years. Now you might be wondering, well that's not that much when we're looking at the grand scheme of things. Some fossils are millions of years old and we're not even towards a million yet. Um, and that's, you know, truth. Um, we can really only look towards, uh, you know, only a small portion of our history using this carbon method. Um, after this point, it becomes way too small of a percentage to, to have, uh, be of note. And so we have to use heavier elements to figure this out as well. Um, to double check our work, we know that uh, one half N equals percent of elements, as I said from the lesson. And so if we have one half N and we said 13 was our number, we should be getting um, uh, the percentage that we want. And uh, we do. One, two percent. Yeah. Um, do you keep in mind when you do this? Uh, you do have to multiply it by 100%. Um, so please keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, uh, this is effectively how you do these two problems. Uh, we're now going to move on. Um, hopefully, this is not too bad. Uh, there'll be a small worksheet where you guys should be able to finish that in about, I don't know, 30 minutes. Um, you'll have eight tries to do it, um, and uh, I'll explain that in class on uh, Wednesday if you are watching this on Tuesday. Um, so let's go back here. Whoops, oops, oops. And so, um, so again, we were essentially using these formulas that we have here, and uh, even if you're you know, not necessarily the best at math, you can technically not use the equations. They just make things easier, and it's a very simple equation percent of element left equals one half over n, or sorry, uh, to the power of n, which is the number of half-lives. So the time, or sorry, the um, number of times it has decreased by 50%. Um, and so we found it via that. Um, here's the work for this. Plugging and chugging, you should get 13 half-lives, which equal this many years old. So there's also some answers here. Um, and so that's pretty much it for when it comes to geology. The rest of this is going to be how do we exactly draw a tree of life um, and going over what exactly constitutes a tree of life. Um, and so there is a bunch of vocabulary here, so please copy this down. It will be important. I'll be using these a lot. Um, and so uh, these vocabulary words, as I am going to go over them, um, a phylogeny, as this is called, the phylogeny in the tree of life lesson, is the evolutionary history of a species or group of species. So we're going to talk about what the heck makes a species um, and you know how do we look at the evolutionary history of those. Um, a taxonomy is just how organisms are classified. So we talked about um, uh, looking at modern day taxonomy, which would come later in the class. And we're going to be talking about how we name organisms. Um, we're going to be using analogy and homology. So similarities due to convergent evolution. Some of you guys may have heard me say analogous evolution. Uh, this is what I'm referring to that. Um, and then homology is homologous evolution here, similarities due to similar ancestry. So these two will become um, almost uh, part of an issue um, when it comes to these kind of tree of lives. When we look at things like a dolphin and say a shark, both look very similar, but they are not evolutionarily history wise the same um, uh, comparatively to say like a dolphin and a dog, which are much closer in ancestry. We're gonna talk about these things called clades. Um, a clade is what you guys are going to be kind of drawing and grouping together um, in the future. And so grouping organisms that share similar ancestry. Um, and so using this idea, you can branch a diagram. So those trees we were seeing, um, similar to a pedigree, for evolutionary history of a group of organisms. So we're going to be looking at cladograms today, talking about stuff like uh, where dinosaurs are compared to everything else. Um, same thing with uh, humans. Um, and then your final... Um, project for not the the sorry not your final project but your unit project will be a cladogram slash phylogenetic tree looking at um, multiple organisms branching um, throughout time um, so phylogenetic trees use time while cladograms just use um, just the you know a general idea that over time we see this change so the length of time is um, in phylogenetic trees while cladograms just have it overall it moved this far and then we're going to be using these ideas here, this domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, 
um, idea. Um, you're not really going to need to memorize all these in order. I think that's crazy. Um, we're going to be focusing on uh, phylums and domains the most. Oh, and then species and genus as well. Um, the rest are useful for specific topics, um, but they will not necessarily be as uh, useful in this class specifically. Um, domains are the largest idea. Um, these will help you start off your trees when you start drawing them. Um, and then you move down from there trying to make things more easy for you to do. Uh, and uh, we'll have examples of all of these as we move throughout these, uh, these lessons. And so um, we're going to start with the largest of the orders here. Um, oh, if you want to pause the, so you can take down notes, um, that is there for you. But this uh, the domain here um, is what we're going to start off with when we're going over the different classifications of organisms. So this taxonomy, how we created this. Um, but archaea, bacteria, and eukarya are the three domains as we saw in those bubbles uh, back on this slide here. So bacteria, archaea, and eukarya uh, being the three main domains. And these three da main domains cover all of life as we know it, at least modern day life. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll talk about where you can find them. Um, archaea is found in the most difficult to survive areas of the world. Um, it, and they exist in the normal world too, but they are most prevalent in these areas because nothing competes better in these essential death traps than uh, archaea does. Um, these were originally called archaea bacteria when your parents were growing up, but um, evolutionarily and DNA wise, we've noticed they are not the same and they're not bacteria in any way. So we've renamed them um, just archaea instead of adding the bacteria part. Um, you'll find them in the hot springs of Yellowstone, in the salt, um, uh, living around the salt in the Dead Sea. We'll find them underneath the ice in Antarctica. Um, and you'll also find them in your soil as well. Um, so these survive in extremely harsh environments really, really well. And they were originally thought to be the, um, the original ancestors, but we're finding out now that it, that is not the case. Um, they are probably the most similar to those, um, but they are not, uh, you know, the, they are not our ancestors, if that makes sense. Um, bacteria come in very wide shapes and sizes. Some are spheres, some are rods, some are circles, um, some are like lines, things like that. Um, these bacteria can be parasitic, they can be helpful, um, and they can also be food for a lot of organisms on the planet. Um, bacteria will also create oxygen for us. Um, so a large grouping of bacteria is very helpful for us on the planet since we need oxygen to do um, our combustion reactions being our cell respiration. Um, and most of you guys are probably more interested in eukarya. This is where animals and plants are. And so here's some interesting animals specifically here. Um, here is the smallest living uh, animal that we have, which is a, an amoeba. Um, this is a uh, single-celled animal. Um, even though it is part of eukarya, um, it is still considered single-celled in this case. Um, the invention of eukarya uh, evolutionarily is mainly due to the mitochondria and the chloroplast being created and absorbed from a bacteria and another bacteria. Um, so the idea was some archaea-like creature um, essentially ate a bacteria and instead of digesting it said you're my new um, powerhouse. Uh, but uh, organisms around the planet, uh, we see that some have backbones, some do not. These are nematodes. Um, these are worm-like creatures, but they are not worms. They are their own classification um, and they are microscopic. Um, I had a teacher once tell me that if you made every building on the planet invisible, you would still see the outlines of the building because the nematodes living on top of them. Um, I don't necessarily believe him, but m maybe that's true. Um, I don't know where he got that math from. Um, uh, this, uh, from there, we see uh, the backbone being created um, eventually evolutionarily, giving rise to large amounts of organisms. It's things like the leech being a very basic form of organism with a backbone. This isn't a leech, this is a lamprey, my bad. Um, and so this lamprey does have a spinal cord like we do. Um, it has gill slits, which we used to have, and it has, um, you know, teeth uh, that it, we have as well. Um, it does not have a jaw, though, um, so that's why its mouth is kind of like a sucker. Um, from there, we do see things like fish, birds, um, and, uh, you know, foxes and mammals specifically um, popping out from, you know, the historical ancestor of the lamprey. Um, and we'll talk more about this uh, as we look at the cladograms in the future. Um, but here we have a glass house fish. You, you can see its eyes and other organs inside of its head. Um, this allows it to look essentially in a larger 
um, degree pattern than we can do with our eyes. Um, this uh, blue alligator skink or lizard um, is quite beautiful, as you can see, with the blue shiny scales. Um, this is a uh, this small bird here is called a great tit. Um, uh, you'll see them in your book, I think, I believe, or at least the old book used to talk about them in ecology. Um, they have really cute songs, and they pair up for life with their partners as well. And then, you know, they're just little fluff balls. They look like uh, tennis balls. Um, and then the fennec fox is the smallest of all foxes, um, and it is purely nocturnal. You can see them at the LA Zoo um, in their uh, nighttime areas, you know, so they essentially flipped the actual day for them, give, putting on the lights during the day or uh, during um, nighttime, and then during the daytime they have the lights off, so they're, you know, rummaging around and whatnot. Um, the kingdoms, you do not need to know the seven kingdoms. Um, these kingdoms are extremely volatile, and what I mean by that is every year we get a new one or some disappear. Um, as of today, this is what I understand the seven kingdoms to be. Um, we have Archaea. So yes, the Archaea, bacteria, the Archaea and the bacteria both have their own kingdom. Um, so it's quite easy when you're naming things. They have the same kingdom name. But eukaryotes, um, since they're so wide in variety, we see large amounts. Um, we see protozoa. Um, protozoans are here. We see things like amoebas um, and paramecium's and a bunch of other organisms. These are all microscopic, um, so you need a microscope to see them. Uh, but they do exist, and they come in large varieties of both predators and, um, or they, uh, both in the form of predators, while also being plants as well. So euglena is an example of a plant-like cell. It does photosynthesis. Um, the next one is chromista. This one is uh, the most uh, volatile one, as I've seen. Um, in the three years I've been teaching at Taft, I've seen it disappear for one year and come back the next um, from certain uh, some, from certain books. Um, I'm going to count it for this just because uh, it does pop in and out of, you know, the ideas. Um, it's kind of cool. It has uh, two vacuoles um, that make it look like it has eyes, a chloroplast in the center, a nucleus that's smaller than the chloroplast itself. Um, it, they all have two tails specifically, which are which help it swim around. Uh, but this is a plant-like creature. It does photosynthesis. Um, plantae. Um, here is a pineapple before that turns into the fruit that you know a pineapple to be. Um, plants, as you know, are a wide variety of organisms. Um, and some have flowers, some don't. Um, I just chose this picture because I think it's important that you guys know that a pineapple comes from hundreds of flowers um, that kind of all kind of melt together. Uh, fungi are also wide in variety. Um, there are the largest organism on the planet is thought to be a single species or single organism of fungi um, that spans an entire forest um, underground specifically and it pops out in random areas um, similar to this fairy ring the actual organism is underground um, and what you see as a fungus is actually the reproductive organ um, so you know the mushrooms you put on your pizza and stuff are the reproductive organ of a mushroom um, fun mushrooms are in fungi. Same thing with mold and yeast and things like that are also in the fungi kingdom. And then all animalia, we're in animalia, pretty cool. Um, this is a whip spider. It is not a spider nor a whip, um, but it is an arachnid similar to scorpions and things like that. Um, it's also called a whip scorpion and it's not a scorpion either. Um, they're actually quite harmless to humans. Um, they use their long uh, you know, terrifying mandibles that you see here, these modified legs um, to grab things and, you know, hit them as well. Um, to smaller organisms, these are deadly, but to bigger ones like us, it's just a scary looking thing. It's not actually harmful. Uh, but you can see videos of them. Um, they have some of them in uh, exotic shops that you can buy, um, but I don't recommend that because I don't think you should get let them out in the environment. Um, and then uh, we're going to go over phylums. Um, uh, one of your unit project will be about phylums. Um, phylums are probably the most useful of the large three big classifications. Um, there are 110 phylums, so obviously there's a lot. Um, you know, but there's a lot less than the amount of Pokemon that you can memorize if you're a Pokemon fan. And so these 110 phylums, for the most part of all animals you know, are probably roughly in, uh, I'd say, maybe 10 to 20 of the phylums will be animals you recognize and think about. Uh, majority of the food you eat comes from roughly five phylums. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a lot of very small creatures on the planet 
microscopic specifically that are in these groupings here. Um, of the 110, 35-ish um, are animals. Um, the reason why this number is not necessarily just, you know, 34 or 35 or 36 is because every year some phylums merge together because of um, some research that comes out and then other times we get some research splitting them apart and so on and so forth. Um, you need a lot of research to prove this, um, but because research is constantly coming out, we're seeing new phylums created and new ones dissolving. So old books are really bad for this. Um, and even I, um, when I learned all my phylums, uh, there was actually only 100. So in about a 10 year span, we see about 10 new ones being taught to people. Um, there might be even more now. Um, we'll use a list on Wikipedia for these phylums just to make it a, you know, a slated list. So you guys can, you know, have all one specific area. <clears throat> but uh, this, this number, for the most part, is roughly 110. Um, this large list here um, is of 30 of the, uh, um, uh, 30 of the uh, 110 phylums we see here. Um, specifically, these are all animals. So of the, um, they're missing four. Obviously, this picture here is from the 80s. So even then, we see a lot of um, radiation from these groups. So some of these don't exist anymore, which is kind of interesting. Um, of the 14 plant phylums, uh, I know a few that are no longer there at all, um, but we'll still use those as examples throughout uh, your projects and things like when you're asking me for help. Um, I'll accept some of the older ones because I was taught those, and you know, I, you know, they're fun to look at. Um, notable ones in here are tardigrada. These are tardigrades, those water bears that I've showed in the past. Uh, mollusca has things like mollusks, um, so things like uh, uh, squid, octopi, uh, mussels, um, not snails, but uh, I might get to think of what they're called. Actually, snails might be in this grouping here, <clears throat> unless I can find it here. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, no, I think, I think snails might be included in this grouping. Um, but today they're in their own phylum, as from what I understand. And so mollusks uh, are very wide in variety and wide in, there's 80,000 species roughly. Um, this number has only gone up. Um, the largest phylum on the planet is arthropoda. Uh, these are things like insects and crabs and spiders and stuff like that are in arthropods. Uh, there are 900,000 plus species of arthropods um, on the planet. Um, their, name, their name specifically means jointed limb. So as you see here, their limbs are jointed, kind of like ours. Um, and uh, you'll find the largest number of species on the planet is in this, at least discovered species. Um, we see uh, very high mutation rates in this, in this grouping here. And so because of that, we see large amounts of species being created from it. Um, we also see echinodermata. Echinoderms are things like sea stars and sea urchins. Um, uh, nematoda are the nematodes um, not to be confused with nematomorpha which I think is gone now but it might still be there um, rotifers are really pretty to look at um, platyhelminids are um, arrow worms <clears throat> tenophores are from this uh, no those are chromatids um, tenophores are also cool to look at um, sponges are in periphera and I'm forgetting where um, actually, yeah, uh, where is, I'm forgetting where corals and, um, jellyfish are in, but they're in here somewhere. It's not recognizing the name. Their name changed also recently. Um, so this is a, an old picture, but it had the most amount of names with the number of species next to them. So that's why I'm using this old graphic here. Um, all of these numbers have gone up drastically. Um, so new species are being discovered and um, research is going towards them as well. Oh, I, I missed uh, Annelida. Um, annelids are earthworms and worms in the ocean as well. Um, so all worm like or all worms are in this Annelida here. Um, and uh, yeah, let's move on. Oh, this is my favorite phylum specifically when it comes to plants. Um, this phylum itself is the or this tree here. Um, you can find uh, around LA as well, but it's more prevalent in the Pacific Northwest and um, it originates from Japan, Korea, and China. Um, so that region there, you'll find this tree. Um, it is called the ginkgo tree, um, G-I-N-G-K-O. Um, its leaves look like this jade green 
fan here um, and it turns like a brilliant gold <clears throat> during the fall um, they have their own fruit that smells like rotting meat um, and things like that but uh, the um, the male trees are usually used because they're extremely pretty um, and they're also really good for telling how bad the environment is outside <clears throat> they die really um, or they'll they'll start losing leaves um, at wrong at the wrong time if there's pollution um, these are the first trees to grow back after the bombs were dropped in Hiroshima and in Nagasaki um, they're also the first organism or the first plant to germinate in other words for the seed to become a plant um, in space and so there's lots of cool things about this plant <clears throat> it is the last of its species in um, or it's the last of its, or this species is the last of its phylum. Um, so, uh, you know, this is an easy phylum to choose because um, it's its own one and there's only one species in that phylum that is currently alive. Um, but a very pretty tree in general. Um, we're not going to go over classes, orders, families, genus, and species examples. Um, there are way too many of these. As you can see, 900,000 species in arthropoda. So just imagine, you know, if there's 110 phylums, how many classes and orders there are. <clears throat> the, these are also more disputed than anything else. Um, and uh, because of that, things get really difficult. Oh, sorry, my voice is starting to scratch. So uh, um, effectively, um, uh, in class, I'll bring this up as well. You guys will have a taxonomy activity. Um, this will be a check in itself. It's not on Schoology at the time of recording, but it will be up by the time I show it to the class. <clears throat> I want you guys to research in quotes um, the taxonomy for organisms of your choosing. So choose four organisms that you want to do. Um, as an example here, I did humans. We are, the species is sapien, which means mind. Um, homo means same. So same mind is our name. Um, we are hominids, which means we stand up on two legs. Um, and uh, we have jointed thumbs and things like that in a larger brain. Um, primates, you know, things like monkeys and uh, other organisms like that um, are in this uh, this order. My God, I'm scratching my throat a lot. I'm going to pause the recording. Okay, uh, I re unpaused it, so hopefully it's recording again. Um, <clears throat> we're in mam we're mammals, so our class is mammalia. Our phylum, which was not talked about in the last slide, is called chordata. This means something with a backbone. Um, <clears throat> so we have a notochord. Uh, as we call it, which allows for the nervous system to be in a very specific area. Um, anything with a backbone is in this phylum, which means that that includes lizards, fish, um, birds, mammals, um, I'm missing anything, uh, the lamprey, things like that, um, are all in this phylum. So a vertebrae, as we call it, um, uh, is the phylum here. Um, kingdom here, we have animalia. <clears throat> so animals, and then our domain is eukarya. So I want you guys to fill out this chart with four other organisms. Choose four of whatever you want. They just can't be humans, as you can see. So if you want to, you know, figure out what the the species of a, you know, a dog is, or a cat, or you know, um, a jellyfish, or something to that extent, um, you'll have to go further. Um, if you look up just you know some general terms like frog and jellyfish and things like that. Um, you'll probably get stuck around order or class, and you'll need to find a specific species to finish that out. Um, so maybe look at, say, a you know a horned frog or you know a sun jellyfish or something to that extent. But either way, um, we'll be doing this activity in class as well. Um, you might be wondering, you know, what's with all the names when it comes to genus and species? Um, and uh, binomial nomenclature, as we talked about prior, was made by Linnaeus. Um, and Linnaeus, uh, for the most part, is um, uh, credited for creating this idea of how to name organisms. <clears throat> he, his rules were, uh, because there's so many on the planet, um, they will have a first and last name, similar to what you guys have currently. And uh, this genus and species is what he called it. The genus is essentially the last name, and the species would be considered your first name, I guess you could say. Um, and so the genus is always going to be capitalized and the species is always going to be lowercase. Um, we'll have some practice of this in class as well. Um, so my, uh, uh, as an example, um, here's a nice video here. Um, the video is right there as well. If you want to copy it down, I'll put it in the video folder, I think even more for that. 
Um, and they'll go over 10 ridiculous scientific names. I'm not going to play it because I'm going to try and upload this video to school, um, not only Schoology, but to YouTube, and I don't want it to be taken down for whatever reason. Um, and so both the genus and species are going to be italicized, underlined, or both when written together. So if you can't italicize, just underline it. Um, or if you like to write in cursive, italicize it, or you can do both. Uh, it's not necessarily overkill. It's always nice to have both, personally. Uh, this will differentiate it from a normal name. Um, uh, say like a, you know, if you're saying a bear, um, instead of bear, you'd say like Ursa, um, Ursa or something to that extent. So instead of saying a grizzly bear, which would not be, you know, italicized or underlined, we're saying the specific species of bear is, you know, Ursa Ursa, which is the genus and species in that case. Um, and so the rules are quite simple. Just use the genus species name. We do not need to write out domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family. In this case, every single organism on the planet is given a specific genus and a specific species. Um, they will share genuses and share everything after that, um, but we really only care about the last two when we're looking at specific organisms. Uh, for groupings of organisms, it depends on what we're looking at. Um, obviously, the more to the left you go in this uh, chart here, the more broad you get. Um, and so phylums are probably the most specific of the broad um, that we see large organisms being thrown into. Um, people will study, you know, either um, some people will study only phylums, some will only study orders, and so on and so forth. Some will only study one species. It all depends on what kind of scientist, you know, you end up wanting to become. <clears throat> um, an anthropologist specifically would be considered a expert on the genus and species of Homo sapiens. Um, so they study that, for, if you're curious. Um, and so, uh, moving on from there, um, oh, for, for this one, uh, if you want some practice, um, look up some other organisms uh, for this, uh, or you can, you know, write out your name as an example, um, you know, uh, as an example, you know, if I wanted to say Mr. Kaplan or something, I would say my genus is Kaplan, because that's my last name, and my first name, I guess, would be Mr. in this case. Um, and so there's only one, I guess, in that case. Um, obviously, some of you guys share names with your grandfathers, your parents, you know, family members, etc. Um, so it's a little different, I guess, for humans, um, but it's it's the best analogy I can make for that. <clears throat> um, so nearing towards the end of this long recorded lesson, and my voice is starting to crack, so sorry if it does. Uh, but phylogenetic trees is what we're going to be looking at as our final idea here. And the phylogenetic tree... Um, is essentially a branching diagram that will tell us how organisms have evolved over time. So um, how species have diverged. Um, and please keep in mind, uh, the present day organisms have evolved just as much as every other present day organism. Um, and so uh, when it comes to time, nothing, you know, organisms are not more evolved or under evolved. Um, only really if you go back in time to look at previously um, uh, you know, extinct organisms, then you might say it's more or less evolved. But even then, it's not really appropriate um, to say that. And so each split in the branch will show a common ancestor. So a dog and a cat, both furry mammal things. They're both pet-like creatures. Um, believe it or not, they have a common ancestor. So there was some split when we look at it in the evolutionary tree. Um, obviously, there are millions of other organisms um, in this, you know, of time uh, that are in between the, the cat and the dog. Um, uh, and also there's probably thousands of species that were in between there as well that have diverged and failed and we see today that these are the two that we see currently. Um, we can also find other organisms and fit them in this chart if we truly want to um, and so uh, like we have here. Um, so if we were comparing say a chimpanzee and a homo sapien um, these are the two present day species that exist in the hominid ancestry um, there are a few others that have branched off from chimpanzee that exist as well, like the bonobo, uh, but uh, that is a type of chimpanzee, I guess, today. So there should be a third species here, but it's not. Um, so some uh, ancestors six million years ago diverged between what would become the chimpanzee and the ancestor of the humans. Um, so there was some speciation that happened there. Um, we see these, all of these, uh, you know, breaking off points that go left and right. We see um, two very closely related organisms, from, or not even that closely related, but starting somewhere around the Australian um, uh, Afrinus species here, 
um, we see a split between what would become humans <clears throat> and some of our um, relatives species wise um, they all died out though they are extinct um, roughly around a million years ago um, the general idea is that the ice age uh, ended a lot of organisms and ones that were more focused on specifically one type of food tended are tended to uh, you know pass away and become extinct um, when we see homo erectus uh, homo neanderthalus and homo habilis um, the general idea for these is that humans um, not necessarily smarter but had a much more wide range of success in different environments so the homo sapien was able to use complex tools similar to homo erectus and homo neanderthalus um, but our diet was different we used fire to cook our food so we didn't get infections as much um, or food poisoning as much you could say uh, we um, we wore clothing to you know to help with the the weather and things like that um, and so you know we survived you know the cold ice age um, that's still currently going on um, comparatively to erectus and neanderthalus um, neanderthalus is still in our dna um, so there is evidence showing that um, we uh, essentially c combined our populations and so their species might have became ours over time <clears throat> but the pure neanderthals were not successful in our new environments that we created and so they essentially disappeared um, their idea is that we uh, killed them off. Um, they are still up in the air, whether or not we did that or not. Um, but, uh, you know, there essentially is only one species left when it comes to this large tree. Um, uh, chimpanzees also have lots of different variants, um, but we're just not focusing on them as much as, say, humans, because we want to know what our ancestry is more than, say, a chimpanzee's. But it does exist. If you're curious, you can see other offshoots for the chimpanzee, just not in this picture here. Um, an example of a cladogram, not a phylogenetic tree. This does not show a re relationship of time and how long it takes. So as you can see here, there's a branch, there's a diagram that says time. And so as you move up, you can see how many years roughly it took for these organisms to, to um, essentially split off from each other and then go extinct. Um, in this case, we have uh, four or five um, very closely related shape-wise species, um, but very far away when it comes to ancestry. So the cat um, or panther or felines in general, so the leopard and the gray wolf, as an example, have a common ancestor being somewhere around carnivora. Um, so somewhere here we see that there is fur. We see this kind of shape of the, the hind legs and the spine being kind of sideways here. Um, we see the long tail, things like that. Um, also sharp fangs being a thing. So the teeth um, being a major function of carnivora. <clears throat> um, we see at uh, number one here, we see that's the um, mustelidae. These are things like badgers and otters and everything in between. Um, splitting off from canines, so things like wolves, dogs, and coyotes. Um, we also see a species abbreviation of coyote and um, the wolf. Um, as you can see, they both are part of the same genus. This is why coyotes look very similar to wolves. Um, the difference is, is that they are, do not breed with each other. Um, coyotes are built for mountain um, or dry mountainous uh, regions, while wolves are generally um, in more wet and snowy environments. Um, and so their species have changed drastically to fit their specific area. Um, and from there, we actually took the gray wolf and diverged it further and created a subspecies that we call the domesticated dog. Um, uh, and so um, we can also see that there was a split between otters and badgers as well, uh, becoming two different genuses in general. Um, so just, um, but all five of these genuses do exist currently today and these species specifically. Um, and so, uh, in order to look at cladograms, these are important, looking at different groupings of organisms. Um, so if we look at these, these are species, but we can use even more broad terms for these. If we remove the pictures of the species, we can just look at their genuses as a clade, a grouping of organisms, as we say it. Um, this includes the species and the ancestor species, so both living and extinct. Um, there's a science called cladistics. This goes over how to group organisms. So people spend thousands of hours trying to figure out how the, these trees are built. Um, and they generally use these general rules that we have here. Uh, these terminologies will be used in order to explain specific groupings. Um, monophyletic will be a perfect clade. It includes the ancestor and all of its descendants. So we'll talk, I'll have examples of this in uh, a second. 
Um, Paraphyllitic is a clade that has the ancestor, but only a few of the descendants, so it's ignoring some. Um, we do this all the time when we're trying to show relationships of organisms, um, like what we did here. If we were only focusing on humans, um, uh, we can you know, essentially look at only a portion of them. So if I drew a circle around you know, Homo sapien and ignored everything else but chimpanzee, this would be considered a paraphyletic clade. Um, and then lastly, we can look at polyphyletic clades. These lack a common ancestor, but are grouped nonetheless. These are the most broken of clades. Uh, they generally do not succeed well when it comes to the scientific community, but they are still important to look at um, when we're comparing. So if we were comparing, say, um, well, no, I'll have examples of this on the next slide, actually. Um, so here's a perfect example of the uh, phylogenetic tree. Um, this is actually a cladogram. I don't know why they put it, wrote it down there as phylogenetic. It does not have a, um, doesn't say how much time is passing as you move to the right. Um, but this cladogram here shows the evolution of species with a backbone. So this is a vertebrae, um, or also known as a, um, a chordate. So chordata um, starts with lancelets, a fish-like creature, um, and then moves down from there. And so all of these are part of the same phylum. So lampreys, tunas, salamanders, turtles, and leopards, all part of the same um, phylum. Um, when we're drawing these, uh, these cladograms, it is important to note when there is a major split, we say a reason why. This helps the reader figure out why exactly we see this split happening. So if we look at lancelets compared to everything else, um, everything past uh, this, this line here has a vertebra, or a vertebra column, so a spinal cord, as you could say. Um, and so this spinal cord is present in the lamprey, tuna, salamander, turtle, and leopard, but not in the lancelet. The lancelet does have something similar called a notochord, which is inside our spine, but it does not have a hard spine like we do currently. So this is a soft spined fish, as you could say. Um, the lamprey does not have jaws, but everything below it does. And so we say hinged jaws. It has a circular jaw. Um, it does not move up and down. It just kind of, um, kind of suctions on, I guess you could say. Um, a tuna um, has fins, but no walking legs, but everything else has four. So salamander, the turtle, the leopard, they all have four specific legs. Um, salamanders give, uh, essentially they just drop their eggs in the water, um, but a turtle has an amniotic egg. This means it has fluid inside. In other words, it has a dry egg as an example. Um, the leopard, while a mammal also gives, also has an egg inside. Um, so essentially it forms inside the body instead of on the outside. So an amniotic egg being inside the womb while a salamander just kind of pops them out. Same thing with the tuna and lamprey and stuff like that. And then lastly, um, the leopard has hair while none of these others have hair. Um, you could have te technically another organism that had hair above there, um, but the general idea is that everything past this will have hair. So as you move down, everything past these lines will have these specific traits. And these help us take, um, you know, clades into account. And so in class, we'll be dealing with this cladogram activity. Um, so this will be a practice. Um, this will count for project and lab credit, uh, but essentially create a cladogram with the following, a dolphin, human, fish, spider, beetle, bird, frog, shark, bear, and one organism of your choosing. Um, if you don't like the idea of doing animals and you're more of a plant person, um, you can replace five above with these uh, here, um, a pine tree, apple tree, daisy, moss, and a fern. Um, and so a challenge, add the four organisms that you had in your taxonomy activity, so those four that you chose. Um, and uh, yeah, so the general idea is uh, I'll be helping you guys in class while you're doing this. Um, uh, I'm not going to be like telling you the right answer, but I'll be you know, kind of giving you hints and tricks there. This will count for your project and lab credits for that. Uh, but create a cladogram, you know, a branching diagram similar to this, um, and uh, include why you think that. This will help me as a, as a teacher, you know, try and figure out why your thought process was this. The idea of these diagrams is to explain your thoughts without having to write out, you know, entire essays. Um, and so uh, after this, we're gonna be looking at monophyletic, polyphyletic, and paraphyletic clades. Um, so here we have a monophyletic clade. It includes the ancestor B and everything prior to this. Um, and so uh, here we have uh, B connecting to C and F, which then have D, E, and G, and H as ancestry. Everything is included here. No, it's not including the A grouping, but it is including the original ancestor in this case. 
at least for an ancestor that we have. Um, if, uh, if we only circled C and F in this case, or as I'll explain here, um, one second, this is colored wrong. Oh, I see, I see, okay, never mind. Um, uh, and so for this uh, polyphyletic clade, we see E and G. Um, these are not related, or they do not include their ancestor of B in this case. This is their common ancestor. And so since it does not include it, it has polyphyletic. Um, and then lastly, we have paraphyletic in this case. Um, paraphyletic is including A and a little bit above A um, on the left, and then everything on the right. So it's not including B and everything else that are you know, part of this. So it's only including a small portion of this tree, which means it's ignoring a large chunk. Um, another example would be if we circled C and F and everything above it, um, where we're not including um, uh, B for an example. Or if we uh, included C um, and then it's everything but D and E, essentially if you exclude things, it ends up being polyphyletic or paraphyletic when it goes up the tree, but you can exclude things that are down the tree, if that makes sense. Um, to explain this more, I have this line here. And so here we have B and E. Um, these two we're saying are related to each other. Um, I would consider this um, uh, paraphyletic. In other words, it, or, yeah, sorry. Whoops. So paraphyletic, or actually this is polyphyletic. So it's, it's looking at two separate clades. Um, so multiple clades here are being in, involved and not the ancestry after that. Um, this large blue one here, I would say, is monophyletic. It's including the ancestor and everything above it. While this bottom one here is paraphyletic, it's including some of the ancestry, but not the entire thing. So as you move up the tree, if you're ignoring stuff, it becomes para. If you're ignoring everything, then it's just poly. And um, monophyletic is what we really want, where we're just having very specific relationships. Um, a lot of the older ideas in biology are due to um, polyphyletic clades, and these have been becoming debunked over time. Um, and then to end uh, this kind of general idea of these clades, um, here is the uh, essentially the clade of amniotic organisms. Um, so these are uh, essentially reptilians and mammalians. Um, so there was a major split between the amniotic organisms, um, essentially the ideal of having a egg on land versus, um, you know, the, with the shell and everything, versus the amniotic fluid being inside the womb um, was the major split between these two species. Um, there were major benefits for this, uh, natural selection-wise, which you guys can probably guess the benefits of having a hard egg versus um, an egg inside the body. But um, from there, we see reptiles splitting off <clears throat> with uh, some larger organisms called pair reptiles. Um, we see turtles somewhere in here. This dotted line means they're not exactly sure where we actually place turtles because um, the shell being the um, skeleton on the outside of the body is quite unique to this organism that we see here. Um, then we see diapsids, which are a larger grouping of, um, for the most part, uh, dinosaur-ish kind of creatures and modern day lizards as well. Um, we see lizards and snakes um, diverging around here. Uh, but you might be noticing this region over here with crocodilians like alligators and crocodiles. Um, and then the dinosaurs, you know, in this region here. Dinosaurs are a very specific um, region of organisms. Um, so yes, the ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, these large um, aquatic reptiles, um, were not considered dinosaurs because they're not part of that clade. Um, but we do see the land dinosaurs, um, uh, like the T-Rex and the Diplodon and things like that, being heavily related to, towards modern day birds. So this region here is a clade um, we call these, this would be considered a paraphyletic clade because it is including some but not the others. So it's not including the flying dinosaurs nor the swimming ones. It's only including the land ones. So the terminology of dinosaur is not really great when it comes to science. It's great when explaining it to the normal person because they just see a giant lizard and that's, you know, for the most part what it is. Um, but birds are inside this clade. Um, and so that means, yes, the uh, the chicken sandwich you're eating probably for dinner or something is a dinosaur. Um, if you've ever been terrified of a bird, um, you know, you'll just say it's because, you know, you can say that it's because they're dinosaurs or something like that. Um, some birds still look like dinosaurs. You can look up the cassowary or um, there are geese with teeth and things like that as well. <clears throat> and so birds are modern day dinosaurs. They are the surviving ancestor um, of 
not ancestor, but descendant of the dinosaur clade. <clears throat> um, uh, actually, um, so interestingly enough, while not a living thing, a virus does have a phylogeny. We can see how this biological material, but not a living thing, has diverged from place to place. And so this link here um, will take us to this place called uh, nextstrain.org, assuming it still works. And we can see how all of the, um, uh, it's not letting me zoom in, uh, but all of the different variants are appearing on the planet. This is supposed to be updated, and it seems like it's been updated as of April. It's May currently. And so we can see how these different kinds of um, uh, viruses have changed. You can also see the uh, percentage of the variants inside each of the um, the groupings here, and so we see that the United States, <clears throat> the United States here, has a large percentage of this um, 20G variant. It looks like uh, also um, the 20I variant, and then uh, the original variant being the 20A that came to the United States. Um, and so on and so forth. The 19A is the first clade to be exist, um, and you can actually go back to the very beginning to see how many descendants there are, and so on and so forth. And these are from um, all the data we have. It's kind of interesting to look at because every country seems to have a different percentage of variants, Europe being pretty homogenized, um, but uh, the rest of the countries being pretty different overall. Um, interestingly enough, we can see that uh, you know Australia has the, probably the largest variety of uh, um, of variants, and this might be due to the amount of travel happening from Australia to Africa and Australia to Southeast Asia and Asia in general, and also Europe and North America traveling to Australia constantly. Um, you do see the large portion of the United States, but they did start closing down a lot of the flights and precautionary ideas. Um, we can see uh, at what time period we see the larger amounts of variants existing. Um, and so COVID-19 versus COVID-20, and eventually we'll have COVID-21 and stuff like that in the future. Uh, but we can see the percentage of uh, them in, uh, in the world. Um, for the most part, the original variant is long gone, is what we see, which is kind of cool. Um, but they have a lot of data that you can use here, which is kind of nice. Um, you can even change it to rectangular if you want to, see it as a normal thing. It is very cluttered, as you can tell. Um, and so because there's so many data points, which is really good for science, but it's really hard to read overall. <clears throat> so that's kind of cool. So you can see all the data points. You can even look at it on a scatter plot if you want to, to see how the variants have evolved over time and so on and so forth. So this picture was taken back in uh, December um, and you can compare it. So you can see there weren't many of the orange colored ones. Um, and now it's a huge portion of this, uh, this grouping here. Nope, I want rectangular. So there's a huge amount of orange variants when originally there was not. Um, interestingly enough, I'm very curious to see how this does change throughout the entire couple of the next couple of years. Um, you know, is the, the reporting from these countries that only have two variants true, um, or are they lying to us? <clears throat> and so, um, you know, take a look at that. It's kind of cool. Um, these variants do propose some issues. Um, natural selection does apply to viruses even though they're not living things. Similar to how natural selection also applies to things like TVs and phones and stuff like that. <clears throat> you know, if it's not used, that won't be reproduced. And for the virus, if it doesn't spread, it won't be reproduced. And so um, this non-living organism does evolve as well, which is kind of cool. And you might be wondering, how the heck do you pick a right tree? <clears throat> um, in reality, we use computers these days because there's thousands of data points we're using. Um, but the general idea is we use this thing called Occam's Razor, this idea that the least complicated choice is usually the best choice. Um, like 9 out of 10, usually the best choice. And so it becomes the, the choice here. Um, we call this maximum parsimony. There's mathematics to, to talk about the accuracy of um, specific trees. And so we can see how, um, you know, we have two trees that look pretty decent. You know, we have these diverging here. Um, you know, which one seems more complicated? The idea is the more groupings you have, um, the more complicated things become. Um, but the more common ancestry that things share, generally the more um, or the least complicated it becomes. So the right one here, I would say, is less complicated. The idea that everything here has a backbone, so they all share the same ancestor. 
we if we're doing very basic things we could say um, that <clears throat> we see uh, in the water and then on land so we see an evolutionary on land here then we see fur or hair being a thing we then see um, being a, a good boy I guess because um, I mean I guess cats can be that but uh, you know I guess uh, more friendly kind of species or more talkative species um, and then you know standing on two legs or something to that extent for the humans um, while this here we have you know aquatic versus hair and the amount of um, breaking off we see is a little too much if that makes sense <clears throat> so while this has more technically offshoots um, or the same number of offshoots um, this is harder to explain than this one overall so the more similarities usually the least complicated it becomes <clears throat> now to end this I'm going to show you guys a couple different versions of the tree of life um, this is one of my favorite ones so not all trees of life as you saw from uh, the uh, the website I showed um, have a um, you know a straight branching line um, this is called the radial form where because there's so many different data points it's easier to show it in a circle um, so it branches out and you know turns into a fan if that makes sense or it fans out this is one way to draw it um, as you can see that they include also the extinct species and so you can see where different organisms exist throughout here um, you know where birds offshoot from reptiles specifically the dinosaurs which are extinct you know we can see where the largest invertebrate existed um, and then uh, one of the largest uh, um, or where uh, octopi and things like that come from where the first fish start appearing and so on and so forth um, where mammals come out in time and so you can see where they also lay down where mass extinctions occur <clears throat> to show why there's such variety in life this here is also major groupings of organisms um, but uh, I believe this is all for the most part bacteria and the different species of bacteria um, this is also a radial diagram <coughs> sorry about the cough I'm, my voice is starting to scratch and so to end this lesson um, man it's been a while wow it's an hour and 30 minutes it's only one class period um, I want you guys to explain to your partner in quotes um, you can say this to your parents I guess that are parent, important to this lecture or your friend you know so when you guys are going over stuff you know what to kind of look for um, and the biggest question I get as a teacher is do humans come from monkeys and the fast answer is no monkeys come from monkeys humans come from humans but the bigger thing is is we both come from a primate ancestor so something that wasn't a monkey nor a human but something that was kind of similar probably closer to what we see as monkeys I guess you could say but we wouldn't necessarily call it a monkey per se because that is a new thing that exists today um, so in the past we had a similar ancestor we see lemurs and whatever everything else coming out tarsiers as well are primates um, but then we get new world monkeys old world monkeys gibbons orangutans gorillas and chimpanzees radiating from this and then hominids being in this as well um, uh, and so these organisms here all share very similar ancestry um, the uh, essentially the removal of the tail um, is appeared roughly 20 million years ago um, but uh, for the most part no the answer is we do not come from monkeys we come from humans or human-like creatures so this is a more um, similar to that chart we showed earlier um, we use things like skulls and our spines and things like that of bones to compare ourselves with these older organisms since DNA is very hard to come by for really old organisms because they've turned into rock at that point um, the homo sapiens as you can see the, the shape of the um, <clears throat> the the shape of the skull changing from um, ancestry to ancestry um, over time allows us to see large change over time and so we can see where we came from so if someone asks do we come from do humans come from monkeys I'll say no we come from some other you know hominid in the homo genus probably homo habilis being a similar ancestry um, but I would never say that we come from monkeys if that makes sense I say monkeys and humans have a similar ancestor um, but no we were not you know humans weren't monkeys humans were humans is the best way to describe that <clears throat> and so uh, we'll be talking about this in class my voice is cracking um, a lot so I'm going to uh, end it at a minute or an hour and 30 minutes um, we'll cover some of this in class as well so don't worry this is more for your guys' use um, since I can't go over everything
and uh, have a great day.